Continuing our discussion of life history theory, let's look at our final topic, which is conflicts between individuals in optimal strategies. So where we last left in the previous video, we were thinking about competition between nestmates or siblings for resources. So for example, in organisms that lay eggs but don't have parental care, we can consider the amount of yolk in the eggs to be resources. Or for mammals, the amount of milk, or for birds, the number of worms that they bring to the nests. Competition from nestmates for resources also reduces the fitness of offspring, which we saw in the example with the birds, where clutches that had been artificially reduced resulted in higher fitness offspring. Let's shift our point of view to that of the offspring. So if we're thinking about behaviors that would optimize the fitness of each of those offspring, what might we expect to see? First, we might expect to see offspring selected to deny resources to siblings, so by competing with one another for the resources. We may also expect to see offspring selected to extract the maximum amount of resources from the mother, because by getting more resources, they're increasing their own fitness, perhaps at the cost of the mother, but for any particular organism, its own fitness is the primary factor that determines natural selection. So let's look at this point of view. For the mother, the mother's fitness is determined by the number of surviving offspring that reproduce. For the offspring, its fitness is determined by its chance to survive and reproduce. And if we think about it from a genetic point of view, maybe the mother and siblings also influence the fitness as well, because they contain many of the same genes, but that was clearly less important, because although they may contain some of the same genes, they're not going to contain the exact same combination of genes as this individual. So earlier in the course, we saw intersexual conflict between males and females when fitness was determined differently. Those different points of views in males or females resulted in interesting behaviors. We can now consider intergenerational conflict between parents and offspring. There'll be certain behaviors that will improve the fitness of the parents at the cost of the offspring, certain behaviors that may increase the fitness of the offspring at the cost of the parents, and this intergenerational conflict is something that can occur and lead to adaptation in the same way that the intersexual conflict uh, that we saw earlier does. So the most useful point of view to take when we're thinking about this intergenerational conflict is the viewpoint of a gene. We know that when we're thinking about relatives, different genes are in different individuals, but different individuals can have copies of the exact same allele. So for example, let's think about two offspring here that share the same mother and father. And let's think about the genes that are in those individuals or the alleles. And we're going to consider the coefficient of relatedness of the genes. So a particular gene that's in this individual, what is the chance or probability that it is in one of these other individuals? So if there's an allele in this offspring, what's the coefficient of relatedness? What's the probability that it's in this particular parent? 0.5. If you pick an allele here, 50% chance it's in this mother. And the reverse direction also works. A allele in this mother, what's the probability it is in this particular offspring? 0.5. What about offspring compared to each other or siblings? If there's an allele in this individual, there's a 50% chance it's in the mother. If it's in the mother, there's a 50% chance the mother gave that one to the sibling. So 50% times 50%. But the other way in which the gene could be in both individuals would be if it comes from the father. So there's a 50% chance it comes from the father. If it's in the father, there's a 50% chance that it ends up in the sibling. So 50% times 50%. So we get a quarter, or 25%, plus 25% gives us 50%. An allele in this individual has a 50% chance of being in this individual. So in fact, siblings are genetically as related to each other as they are to any individual parent. And of course, any organism is fully related to itself. What's the probability that an allele in this individual is in this individual? One. So from a genetic point of view, if we're thinking about natural selection favoring the reproduction of certain alleles, selection is going to be stronger to aid an organism's self compared to aiding siblings or parents, because those individuals, there's only a 50% chance that the allele will be in those individuals. So a mutation that causes a benefit to parents or siblings is only having a 50% probability of assisting other copies of itself in those individuals, versus if it provides a benefit to itself, there's a 100% chance that the gene is in that individual. Um, now these 50% 
values can become important later, as we'll see, but for now, we'll consider the case in which selection for this individual is stronger than selection for these individuals from this genetic point of view. So let's think about a cost-benefit ratio for more milk production, say in mammals. So what is the cost for more milk production? So this is by longer weaning or more milk per day. Well, the cost is to the mother's survival and future reproduction. So individuals that provide more milk have a reduced chance of surviving and their reproduction in the future will likely be compromised. The benefit of increased milk production is to the offspring's survival and their own potential future reproduction. So now let's think about it from the points of view of each of these individuals. From the mother, the costs of more reproduction are fully realized in terms of the genes in that mother, but the benefits are discounted by 50% because any particular allele in the mother, there's only a 50% chance it's in the offspring. On the other hand, from the point of view of the offspring, the cost of additional milk production is discounted by 50% because for each allele in the offspring, there's only a 50% chance it's in the mother who would be suffering this reduced survival and reproduction. But of course, the benefit is fully realized any allele in the offspring that results in increased milk production would receive the full benefit. And selection acts to maximize the cost-benefit ratio, but these cost-benefit ratios are different, right, in the parents and the offspring. So increased milk production for a mother, the cost is twice as much as the benefit, so there'll be stronger selection to limit milk production. Whereas for the offspring, the benefit is twice as much as the cost, so you would expect there to be selection to increase milk production. For each individual, being selfish is favored, but the optimum kind of way to be selfish differs. Selection in mothers is going to drive the optimum amount of milk production to be less than the selection in the offspring. So this is where we get a conflict between the amount of milk production that would maximize the mother's fitness, the amount of milk production that would maximize the offspring's fitness from these genetic points of view. And so you get this tension and this conflict in the amount of milk being produced. There are a number of other examples of this sort of thing. There's this term placental wars. It turns out that when you look at the development of the placenta, there are a number of factors that are secreted by the developing embryo to cause the increases in the growth of the placenta to provide more blood and more nutrients to the embryo and fetus. And there are other factors that the mother secretes to actually slow down the growth and limit the growth of the placenta. And so you end up with this conflict back and forth. And in most individuals, there's a balance where the factors secreted by the embryo are kind of balanced by factors secreted by the mother, and you end up with a kind of typical average sized placenta. But this can actually lead to problems, um, especially uh, we can see this in humans, if an embryo does not secrete as many factors as is average, then the placenta can actually be small, and in fact, you can end up with a undernourished um, embryo and fetus, and actually sometimes a miscarriage because of that. On the other hand, if the mother doesn't secrete enough of her factors, the placenta can in fact get quite large and poses a risk to the health of the mother. In most individuals, there's a balance because natural selection in offspring is countered by the natural selection in the parents, and you get the factors balancing each other. We can see early versus late weaning behavior. If you look at this kangaroo here, this kangaroo does not need to ride around in this pouch. It could get out and do its own hopping, but it's saving energy by riding around with the mother, and at some point the mother is going to kick it out of the pouch. And there's actually a conflict between individuals when the care like this is stopped. And in particular in weaning, this is when milk is being given to the offspring. There's often behavioral conflicts and fights and essentially arguments between parents and offspring. The parent stops giving milk to the offspring, the offspring keep trying to get milk, and there's a big battle kind of between those. Regression behavior is interesting. Um, it's been argued that when we're dealing with our small children and they're trying to extract resources from us, for example, we're in the mall and, they, and we're walking around and the little kid gets tired and they want to be carried around like a little kangaroo, as an adult walking with them, we often say no, and the kid could walk, right? We know these kids aren't genuinely incapable of walking, but what do they do? What strategy do they take well, they don't use logic because they're small children, but they start crying and they fall down and they actually start acting like babies. They actually start acting like individuals that are younger than they really are, perhaps in a way to trick us into thinking that they're younger than they are and actually require some assistance. 
So this regression behavior where individuals act like they're younger than they actually are, it's been argued that this is an evolutionary adaptation based on tricking the opponent in this conflict into thinking that they're younger and at an appropriate age to receive this sort of treatment. And of course, that's exactly what this is here. So we can see a number of potential and definite examples of intergenerational conflicts because the, the point of view of these individuals is different. Genes in different individuals are being selected in different ways.